Uh, I just <laughs> I wanted to hold, hold a little bit of space just to see if anybody had any questions or comments from the last couple of uh, classes that we did. So um, two weeks ago we talked about Milarepa, uh, the story of the hunter and the deer, about how um, a person can uh, affect the, the environment around them. Uh, last week we talked about the Lotus Sutra and the Flower Garland Sutra about how um, the sutras a lot of times they'll use analogies of, of rain or water for aspects of the teachings. Um, had some really good discussion with that too. So just wondered if anybody had any questions or anything come up from that? No? Okay. All right. So um, this week's uh, text is not from the Dharma Rain book. Um, we, I actually uh, pulled spiritual director privilege and went with a different text. Um, and it's called, it's actually from this uh, text called Finding Rest and Meditation. Sometimes you'll see it called Finding Comfort and Ease, the trilogy. Uh, this is the second part that is really a meditation manual um, that the author Long Chempa wrote back in the 1400s, I believe it was, so a really long time ago. And in this particular manual, what he's doing um, is he's writing this for people who want to devote time to practice uh, in, a, in a more stru uh, structured retreat setting. So when you read the text, it probably read a little more formal, like I'm going into a retreat. So just be aware of that. But uh, I find there's bits and pieces that you can pull out of it that really can uh, apply to your own practice when you're trying to do a, a meditation practice. And so in this particular text he has, it's three parts. So the first part is about the environment. Second part is about the practitioner, what we kind of have to have, uh, the good uh, qualities we need to have. And then the third part is actual meditation instructions. Um, this particular text also comes from the tradition of the Vajrayana or uh, Tantric Mahayana practices. Uh, and in this text, when he talks about shamatha, shamatha or calm abiding, vipassana, clear insight, he's doing it in kind of that, that view of Tantric practices. So, so probably a little bit more yogi practices than we would uh, necessarily uh, think about when we think about shamatha or vipassana. A great example of these is like the meditation you might do in a kumne uh, environment. There might be some exercises or some movements that you do to help uh, calm the mind um, with, with just the movements of, of the body itself. In this text, uh, it only has 11 verses. And in the very beginning of the text, he starts to talk about uh, when you want to go into a retreat type setting or you want to do a meditative type practice, you really want to have your body, I would say, in line with the seasons. So he, he talks about that in the very first uh, verse. He says, the places we shall consider, this should be a pleasant solitude, uh, amenable for practice in the year's four seasons. In summer, you should meditate in regions that are cool and in cool habitations. In snowy places, mountaintops, uh, fortunately for Kansans, we don't get that. Uh, in shelters made of bamboo, reeds, or grass. In autumn, you should stay in regions and in dwellings where the cold and heat are often of equal, uh, equal strength. In places such as woodlands, hillsides, rocky forts, with corresponding conduct, food, and clothing. In wintertime, you should adopt, uh, adapt your bedding, food, and dress and live in dwellings that are warm and in low-lying regions, forests, caverns, houses made of earth. In spring, it's most important to retire to mountains, forests, islands, and to dwell in shelters where the heat and cold are balanced, with food and dress and conduct all in harmony. So what he's saying here, and I think for us as practitioners, is the environment that's, that surrounds us really does have an impact on our practice. And when I talked about do, uh, in the Dharma talk, uh, one of the challenges I asked people to do, kind of the homework, was to experiment with your environment. Um, and I don't know, did anybody have an opportunity to, to do that, to practice, to make any minor adjustments? I, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I moved my little shrine from one part of the room to 
to another spot and he just felt nicer, a bit more relaxed. Okay. Uh, so it was a nice, nice change. All right. It was a simple change, but it was different. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't this week, but uh, at my new job, on my lunch break, I've actually found a empty cubicle in the back where nobody will bother me, where I can sit, you know, for, for 20 minutes during the lunch break. <clears throat> so just the experimentation of, of experiencing that in that environment, mm -hmm. as opposed to at home in front of my shrine, which I actually, I'm very fortunate to have a really nice, very comfortable place at home to, to, to be able to meditate, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a whole different experience in that kind of circumstance. Even if I'm quiet and away from everyone, just that awareness that the, this is all going on so close to me is incredibly distracting and difficult to, to be able to get centered. Whereas when I sit at home, it's pretty easy for me to, to slide right into where I need to be. Yeah. I, I think the Remay Center is a really interesting example that, especially before we had air conditioning in this building, it would be autumn, you know, and you're sitting there trying to meditate and you're just, you know, drenched in sweat and then we had these big uh, industrial sized fans and everybody would crowd in front of the fan and your hair you know <laughs> you're just being buffeted by wind as you try to meditate your eyes are raw and then in the winter time you know the heat comes on but it's not the best so you you're walking around and or you're trying to meditate and it's freezing um, our poor kumne practitioners upstairs uh, have that experience still because in the summertime the air still doesn't really work all that great up there so they're hot in the summertime the heat doesn't work that great so they're cold um, you know so you really do see as you practice how kind of just even like temperatures and, and other aspects can really affect your mind um, and that's what Long Chempa is really trying to point out that you know we shouldn't just and and I think in our modern sense uh, with like air conditioning and, and heat and you know more modern amenities, we, we forget some of this. But he's saying that you know you, you should adjust yourself according to the seasons with diet and with clothes so that it, when you do try to meditate, it, it, you do find a, a better balance. And especially in his writings, he's writing from Tibet, you know, kind of the roof of the world. So when it's cold, it's really cold. Um, and when it's nice, you know, it, it really is uh, quite quite stunning and and so he really is giving this advice not from you know I read this in a book somewhere but from his own personal experience his own advice uh, to students is really like look at your environment and again he's writing from the Tibetan uh, viewpoint but we could still see that with even our own aspects you know if if you're going to go do a retreat even if it's like a weekend retreat you know, uh, if it's winter time, are you going to go up to Minnesota to do your retreat? Or would it be better to maybe have it in like Arizona or something like that? Um, and vice versa. In the summertime, you probably don't want to be in Arizona doing, doing your retreat. I don't care how much they say it's dry heat. You know, you're still, uh, it's going to be hot. All right, so now he goes into uh, this aspect of uh, looking at the dwelling places themselves. And so he says, the external internal cycles of dependent uh, coincidence... Therefore, stay in pleasant solitudes and pla uh, places of delight. Since on mountain heights the mind is clear and vast, these regions where all mental dullness clarifies are beneficial to the practice of the generation stage. In uh, snowy lands the mind is bright uh, with lucid concentration. These are places uh, pro propitious, right? Is that what the word is? Propitious? Yeah. Whew. <laughs> For the practice of deep insight. For here, there are few obstacles. In forest groves, the mind grows calm and mental stillness manifests. These are places where one trains in calm abiding and where mental bliss grows strong. At the foot of rocky crags, a sense of transience and uh, a weary sorrow with some sorrow strengthens. The clear and powerful union of calm abiding and deep insight is achieved. On riverbanks, the mind's imagination is curtailed. Sorrow at samsara and the deci uh, decisive wish to part from it will rapidly develop. Charnel grounds are powerful places where accomplishments is swift. Such places it's taught are most uh, propitious. Propitious, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Mm -hmm. For any of the practices of generation and profession. So, I, one of the things I like about this, again, as uh, residents of Kansas, you we don't really have an opportunity to go up to a mountaintop. 
Um, but I would say, or I would make the argument that we do actually have um, aspects of, um, you know, going to Colorado uh, or going into the Ozarks, you know, where you're just spending a couple hours. I would even say if you go, if you've ever been out to like central or western Kansas, it becomes vast. Um, I mean, it's, you, you don't really need a mountaintop. It's just, there's no trees and it's just as the horizon as far as you can see. And one of the things I think as, as meditation practic practitioners, um, and especially with the environment that we should look at is how the environment around us influences our practice. So if we're trying to do like a calm abiding meditation where we're trying to settle the mind, you know, if you have this, if you're, if you're out at a park and there's a lot of traffic, you're probably not going to find that calm abiding quite so easy. But when you're in your house or in a, in a room, um, where there's not a lot of distraction, you'll find it a little easier. On the other hand, if you're trying to do um, kind of insight meditation or, or practices where you want a more spacious view, you're going to find that being in a room kind of with closed walls is going to be uh, an obstacle to that. Uh, versus if you're sitting kind of outside with, a, with not a lot of obstacles in front of your gaze, you know, even if you're not like gazing out, you're just sitting, but you still have just an open field of vision. You're going to find that your your mind becomes a little bit more sharp and becomes a little bit more uh, conducive for more of that insight or even analytical uh, meditation. So, again, these are things, these are advices that he's giving us to practice. And I think as, as practitioners, we should really look into these practices. The problem is, and I think what kind of brings us back to this bodhisattva challenge in relationship to the environment, is that if our environment around us is, you know, disgusting, um, you know, if you're sitting there and you're trying to meditate, you know, on the steps of the Rime Center, and you have the sewer gases coming out of the vent in the summertime, or you got a lot of, a lot of trash on the ground and stuff like that, you're going to find that that can negatively impact you. And I think as practitioners, that kind of makes us want to see our environment uh, be in a better state so that way it be, can be more conducive. Uh, having you know, more green spaces, even in an urban uh, center, so that people can have a little bit of that aspect of nature um, around them so that they're not, it's not all concrete and asphalt, I think is uh, really, really important. So he goes into a couple of other things, um, and again, this, this, these first things are really for uh, beginner med meditation practitioners, people who want to go and retreat. Uh, and the next one, he talks about towns, markets, um, you know, talking about these aspects. He says, beginners are distracted and are hindered in their practices. Uh, for those who have stability, such places, um, again, not, not a big issue. So to sit and try to meditate outside of the Rime Center with all the congestion and the fire station and everything like that, if you're a brand new practitioner, meditation is going to be almost impossible. But if you really have a stable practice, it, what he's saying is it doesn't matter where you practice. Uh, and again, he, we're, in this particular text, we're looking at trying to develop a, a, like a, a shamatha or a calm abiding practice, uh, shamatha vipassana, calm abiding insight. And so he, it kind of goes into a little bit of these different places and localities. Um, but I think on verse 5, he sums it up. He says, since in dependence on your dwelling place, your inner mind is changed, the virtuous practices, uh, practice thrives or languishes. To ponder thus your dwelling is a point, so is, it is said, of high importance. So he really is kind of driving it home that we... Um, we really need to look at our environment. Um, even though we may say, oh, well, I meditate in my house. You know, what's the condition of your house? You know, if you find it cluttered, you may find that <laughs> your meditation practice will be a little cluttered. Um, so, especially for those of you who have a meditation, um, you know, to maybe make changes to the room and just, you know, tweak it a little bit and see how that affects your practice. I was even saying, you know, sometimes it's nice if, if maybe you have like a open window that's kind of uh, has a view, maybe just move your cushion, you know, so when you meditate, you're kind of out, outside of the window. Um, 
Somebody said, well, but I have a bug screen. And I'm just like, well, don't know what to tell you there. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I think to, to have us make these adjustments um, is really important. And really important, especially at the beginning, to just allow yourself that freedom to say, no, I don't have to have it exactly like this. I can move it around. You know, even like trying to, like if you had a, a big shrine like this in your house, you know, you're going to probably find that way too distracting. So maybe even something simple or maybe not even a shrine, like when you're sitting, not even have a shrine in front of you, you know, in your view, have it maybe in a different area. Uh, okay. Okay. So then he gives, uh, and we'll skip a little bit of verse 6. What he's saying in verse 6 is that uh, depending on your, the activities, um, you want to have an environment conducive to that. And I'll just give you a quick example. Um, that doing like a practice like chud, right? So does everybody know what chud is? No? Okay. So chud is a practice that um, kind of started in, in Tibet, it's very popular amongst Tibetan Buddhists, but it's all about uh, severing, and chud means cutting, so severing your uh, self-grasping mind. Uh, and so what they do is, is a ritual practice where you're visualizing your body, it's actually kind of gruesome when you think about it, but you're visualizing your body being chopped up and, and offered to ghosts and demons and all the scary stuff in your life. You know, things that make you really want to cling to, to your, yourself. And so you're doing this visualization of, of giving this offering. Um, sometimes it's called a beggar's offering because whenever you have nothing else to give, you can offer your body. And in, and in this visualization practice, if you're just doing it in a very peaceful place like this, it's good, but it doesn't, you don't really have the, the fear, the, the self-grasping, I guess the self-grasping that you have like if you're frightened. And so when you're doing that kind of practice, you want to be in a more frightening environment, something that, you know, your senses are a little more heightened so that when you're doing this practice, because for the Tibetans, they are seeing like these demons and, and ghosts and monsters coming and devouring animals and, and all this stuff, um, devouring their body as, a, as this offering with the intention not to frighten themselves, but to sever any kind of self clean Because when you're frightened, that grasping to self is very strong. And so by having your environment create that atmosphere, that makes you want to uh, see that, it makes you see that a little, little more clear. And so what, that's what he's talking about here, is that it, there, are, there may be certain practices like Chin and other practices that you, you want to have a, a, a a very specific environment to do that. So um, it'd be like going out at the graveyard at midnight, you know, if people still have that as their issue. So, um, and then they go into this aspect of uh, verse seven. He says, a meditation shelter in a peaceful uh, place should be set apart in solitude in a site that is congenial, very open, spacious place where all around one sees the sky is most conducive. So again, this is kind of that insight meditation. But what I think is really important is this notion that when we practice, we want to be in an in a environment of solitude, um, that we're not going to get bothered. Even in our houses, we, we want to have that. We want to have some kind of barriers so that way when we're sitting, we're not going to have a lot of distractions. Our family's not going to come in. Our pets aren't going to come in. Um, we're just able to uh, focus on our practice without distraction. And so when we are doing a formal practice, having solitude, like going into retreat, that's what it means. You're kind of going into a, like a formal solitude. You're, when you do that practice, whether it's like this uh, Saturday's half-day retreat, you come in uh, at 9 o'clock. You know you're going to be done at noon. Between nine and noon, you just have nothing else to do but the Zen meditation practice that they're doing this weekend. Uh, when we do our full day, you know, it's the same thing. You come in at, at you know, eight or nine, you stay until the evening, and you know for that entire hour, you know, life stays outside the doors. You don't want to bring all that in. And so it really gives you a chance to just be one focus with your, with your practice. 
And then he goes into a little bit of this aspect of if you do, they call it a, a dark retreat or like a nighttime retreat. Again, it's a method that they use in Tibet. Uh, it's almost like sensory deprivation. If any of you have seen kind of more modern, I know they have like the float tanks here. Has anybody ever done, try to do the float tank where you just, it's all that and you're just, it's the same, it's, it's the Tibetan version of that. It's the Tibetan version of the float tank. Um, and then of course they have um, just more advice for when you're doing these, these type of practices. All right, so let's, um, what I, want, what I think we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll break up into groups. And how many of us are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sixteen. Oh, good. We can do four groups of four. Um, so what we'll do is we'll break up into groups. And one of the things I would like us to, to discuss um, is how does, in, in, in your own practical way, your own experience, how does your environment affect? How has it affected your practice? So give us, talk about actual examples, talk about, um, you know, uh, successes, obstacles, whatever it is, as you've tried to meditate, what, are, what have been some, some influences of the environment that you've, you've noticed? Um, and then as, after we talk about that a little bit, let's talk a little bit about what can we do to change our environment, to make it more conducive to practice. What are things in our immediate sphere of influence? I'm not talking about like the grand scale of like, well, if we all had clean air in the, in the world. Yeah, but to really just like, and you know, clean air is, is a nice thing, but you know, what is it that you can do tomorrow to make a change? You know, and, and, and do a little bit of discussion about that. And, and then if there's anything in this, this text when we come back that you were like, oh, I don't understand that or, or what do they mean by this? Because there's a lot of ghosts and spirits. That's another thing I, I kind of, Tibetans don't necessarily talk about is they have a lot of spirits and ghosts and, and things in the environment. Um, I think we have in our own spaces have really uh, sanitized a lot of that um, due to kind of our modern way of thinking. But if you really look at, you know, where your roots are from, you know, there's always these wonderful myths and lore and, you know, like gnomes and leprechauns and all that kind of fun stuff, you know. Uh, but the, the Tibetans also understand that a lot of this environment is just a reflection of the mind. So something that's scary, it's, it's your mind that's the aspect that's scary, not necessarily the outer environment. So um, anyways, so let's uh, count off to fours and then we will uh, chat for, oh, let's do about 25 minutes and then I'll ring the bell and then we'll come back and discuss and then have somebody from each group kind of take notes and we'll have them just speak up. So uh, we'll, we'll go clockwise. So one, two, three. All right. Well, welcome back. Kind of like some good discussions were going on. So we're going to have, uh, we have about 20 minutes left. So let's maybe spend a couple minutes each group uh, wanting to share. So let's, uh, let's start with group four. What, did, what do you all have to, who wants to? Oh, we mostly just shared our experiences with, okay. the, you know, where we meditated. Yeah. Any, any interesting stories or? Well, let's see. <laughs> Somebody else say that. It's nothing really interesting. I mean, I think we were kind of sharing where we meditated. And I had, about a year ago, I mean, I used to meditate in my room in front of the shrine. And I felt like it was just, and so I went to the living room where I have the big window and it's always open and all the trees and I felt so much better there and I could, it's just better mm -hmm. and then I go outside and it's warmer but then we just she was saying that she went from room to room to try and find the yes. best place well I've been there quite a while and you know so that those changes are over a period of yeah several years yeah. And did you eventually find a place that you well I'm in I 
finally put my shrine in my bedroom, and oh. it seems to work best. Yeah. We talked about a lot of things. Yeah. That was kind of where we started. It was like everybody's individual practice, different areas they've tried it in. Uh, and then from there, we kind of went, kind of went away from the question of felt like maybe. I don't even know exactly where we went after that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a walk. We, 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 yeah, we went a little bit away from the question and then we came, kind of came back to it. We talked about... Um, we went into that meadow with the trees that we found, got lost in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talked about practicing in nature in different places. Kind of individual's experience with that. Water. Yeah. <laughs> I talked about water. Yeah. Um, Tame issue from last week. Yeah. Nice. Sometimes it's nice just to kind of get the conversation started and just let it go naturally to wherever it wants to go. Uh, group three, any any insights or thoughts? Who's our... Well, yeah. Patty had a really interesting experience. She went from, well, you can tell, from, from practicing in an open place upstairs and then she would uh, start practicing downstairs in her comfy chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And did that, you find that more helpful? Or? Yeah, I got distra I'm distracted downstairs in my comfy chair. So downstairs I'm like, okay, so my upstairs it's in the bedroom and my shrine and it's in front of the east window mm -hmm. and outside the window, it's a second story window and so there's um, there's a really pretty rock wall and I have my prayer flags hanging out there and so it's pretty to look out at and um, but also it's easy to look, just like soften my focus and not be looking at anything in particular because it's a rock wall and greenery mm -hmm. and so um, that that's the best place for me so down in my comfy chair it's kind of like like diagonal in the corner of the living room, I can look out the back this way, but you know, yeah, I can't like meditate like that. <laughs> so, um, and then I have a Buddha on the piano over here, and there is a Buddha over there under the TV, and then there's one like behind me, but I'm not sitting in front of anything that could be a shrine in the living room. Okay. We're just surrounded. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tracy and, and Linda both um, like to practice after yoga. Okay. And they find their yoga practice is really conducive to good meditation. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Tibetan yoga? Tibetan yoga? Uh, we do. We do the Linda does oh, the yes. Kune. I don't know what. I do Ashtanga yoga. Mm. But something just more like kind of body work and just kind of physicality that really could just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And several of us really like practicing in groups. Mm -hmm. You know, my practice is uh, basically is, is Zen practice, and, and I really like practicing this in a group. You know, we're always facing the wall, so there's less distraction. It's kind of the opposite of, of spacious, but. Uh, Especially for me, I really appreciate the, the group practices. Great. Uh, group, group two. Who's our note taker? I got some notes here. Okay. <clears throat> we, covered, we covered a lot of ground. Um, you know I, know, I know for me personally, it was also just really interesting because I don't get to have that conversation much with people. It was like, what's your practice space like? Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a specific kind of so it was really nice to be able to to hear, you know, kind of how everybody, where, where everybody sits or, or, you know, what their experiences are and, and their approach. Um, I think we talked about, you know, keeping keeping the space clean. I know, I know for me that it's always, it's always more comfortable when I've got the room that, that my shrine is in clean, you know, and, and the mountains of dog hair have been swept up and vacuumed. Um, <laughs> You know, and then also with visual distractions, uh, with squirrels and mailmen, you know, walking across the, 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 the glass or, or the, the window, whatever. Um, you know, and, and everybody kind of having their own visual distractions or even distractions that aren't necessarily being picked up 
from from those senses, but just even the mental sense door where, you know, if there's a shoehorn that's left behind the, the shrine, and then even though it's, it's not visible, you know it's there. Or being at work and trying to sit for a minute, and even though you can't necessarily hear or see anybody, just knowing them, them being there is, is can be, you know, counterproductive or, or difficult, <clears throat> which kind of led into the idea of compromise. Okay. You know, I have written compromise with Kite. Um, you know, animals and, and other experiences, uh, and and being able to, to even though sometimes that's not the most conducive experience, but then finding a skillful relationship with that. When I was talking about, you know, realizing that you could spend half an hour chasing his cats out of the room, or he could spend half an hour just you know acclimating to the fact that the cat's going to be mm -hmm. there. You know, uh, which made a lot of sense as far as just allowing the frustrations or maybe even the distractions if you can't remove them from the experience to allow them to be your teacher, you know, which was, I thought was, was a really, really great point. Let's see here. Uh, talked about minimizing clutter and how that kind of helped with the, and the, having a designated space, just, just being able to be able to sit there and, and be comfortable in that space. Experimenting with less than ideal circumstances and seeing how those affect your mind, you know, mm -hmm. which once again was a great idea that, you know, that Brand was talking about. Um, because even with, I know with the uh, pranayama and other things that you don't, they don't just have you breathe slow so you can see how that affects your mind in a calm way. You also breathe quickly to see how that's more aggravating and disrupting. So you have that total experience. Mm -hmm. so, you know, putting yourself in maybe not the most conducive experiences is also a good thing to be able to, to have in that wisdom bank. Um, and, oh, and then also having, you know, environmental r reminders and, and, and sort of um, cues, you know, I know that, that I have my mala and, and I have, you know, pictures uh, that I, I keep on my desk at work that I take with me that, you know, they'll go on my shrine at home or even just the fact that I've, I'm lucky enough to have my, my room the way it is with, with my shrine, you know, right there by my front door so that when I walk out the door I see the, the water bowl sitting there in the morning when I come back in they're there, you know, um, or even have like, I have prayer flags in the backyard so that these experiences throughout my house and even at work, when I'm being a knucklehead, or I'm not being aware of myself, then, then these cues help me to get, before I get too far outside of that, okay. you know? And so, yeah, we had a really good conversation as far as engaging with the environment and, and how that affects our practice. Nice. Uh, group four, I'm not biased here, but you know. <laughs> Conversation was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Dope. Um, I did. I thought we had a great discussion too. Um, and we we um, talked about finding our own space, like with the rest of you, um, trying to eliminate pets or distractions, um, and um, the fact that that. It's a, a work in progress, you know, you, you find something else you want to declutter. You know, you probably didn't notice it before, but then you begin to look around and say, where do I really want this? And, and um, I got a suggestion about live plants, putting something live in the space where you're going to be doing this. But the deeper discussion was, was about finding a quiet space. And then Mike, is that your name? Yes. Mike brought up the fact that he, his preferred space is where there's a lot of activity going on. And then he, he loves that so that he can be at peace within that. If I'm saying it right. Very well, yes. And, um, but also we talked about how nice it is to do the meditation with a group. You know, having other people around who are doing the same thing. And you feel very supported and very, you know, connected with that um, uh, deeper sense of meditation. And, um, uh, experimenting with different places, like in the summer when it gets warmer outside, you know, and then going outside, 
being in nature and experimenting with that. Kind of like this, we care with them. Also, um, how how um, neat it is to go on retreat so that you can be with people who are actually very committed and doing the same kind of thing that you're doing. And also, how when you walk into a place that has that vibe, you can kind of uh, really pick that up right away. This is a really a space where I can really settle down and meditate. So there were a lot of really good ideas, I thought, in our group. A lot of, a lot of connections. Anything else, Matt? Yeah, no, I, I, I you know, one of the things I, I, that he talks, just Long Chip at the very end talks about, is this notion also of kind of intentionality of location in your practice. but. What I, what kind of came up in our discussion a little bit also was just this notion, and of, you know, when you go into retreat or you go into a place that has been doing meditation for a long time, there's just kind of an energy that's kind of been created um, that that does create that that kind of conduit for your practice. That uh, and you know usually retreat centers and other places like that that are developed as a place where you you know that intentional community where you can get away, you feel that. But at the same time, you know, uh, and I hear it from people when they talk about like coming into the Remy Center, they, they just kind of feel like, oh, I'm here. It's, it's a place that's going to be more conducive for meditation, even though, you know, when I first walked in also, I was like, wow, there's a lot of color in here and a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I also felt like, wow, I, I feel like I could really sit, you know, in this place uh, more than than I could if I was just you know, out in a park or something. Uh, but I feel that even when, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a Buddhist retreat center. When, I, when I've when i done a summer retreat, it's at a, a Benedictine uh, monastery. You know, I have the same exact uh, feeling. Like when I walk in there, it's like, oh, I'm here to do a practice. I'm here to go and retreat. I feel that kind of energy of past um, contemplative meditation people or uh, practitioners so that it it does help um, with with the environment or it, that that setting does help with my practice um, so yeah I, I thought I thought you all had really wonderful great discussions um, so this week again uh, I would say if there's one takeaway that I that I hope that you all do is, is really just ex I don't want to, well, yeah, let's call it experiment. Experiment with your meditation practice. You know, look at different settings and the environment um, and how that impacts your mind. Um, it may impact it negatively um, or it may impact it positively, but just look and see how it is because I think sometimes, especially as meditation practitioners, we don't necessarily um, think about it. We just are like, okay, I got to do my practice. Uh, here's my cushion and I'm just going to sit and, and meditate. And I think one of the things that Mike really brought up in our group was this notion that, you know, even when things are difficult or, or um, I can't remember the word you, you specifically used, but just the, you know, you just sit with it. You, you just don't, don't try to push it away. Um, don't try to grasp onto a pleasant situation. You just work with it. You know, that's, that's what you got. That's what you work with. But again, to this week intentionally change it up a little bit and see how that is and, and just sit with it. Uh, and I, I shared a story that Santa Caro, back before we had air conditioning, he, he was doing a retreat in August and it was just awfully hot um, to the point that we were all drenched in sweat as soon as you walked in. And he kind of had to stop and say, listen, you're gonna sweat, it's hot, that's what it is, let's meditate. You know, and as soon as he said that, it was like, oh, okay. I can just let that go and just sit. So um, next Sunday I'll turn the heat off so it'll be nice. And cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be comfortable. You all can sit. No, I'm just Gabby will watch this video and be like, no, I'll turn on the heat. <laughs> all right, so uh, next week um, we don't necessarily have a reading out of the book. 
um, of Dharma Reign. Instead, Geshe La is going to talk a little bit about the, the aspect of the Bodhisattva in relationship to activity. So why, when we talk about wanting to be a bodhisattva, uh, a being uh, that is trying to develop compassion to elim uh, eliminate the sufferings of others, in relationship with the environment, why is it that we're connecting the bodhisattva to the environment? So that kind of bodhisattva activity, that, that um, intentionality of the bodhisattva, um, he's gonna talk a little bit about Sunday. And then Wednesday, We'll have just kind of an open discussion about that. So, all right. Lights off, so that means we're done. <laughs> so we'll uh, end with our dedication of merit. <laughs>